Hello everybody, welcome to Tips and Tricks Tuesdays with me, Valentina V. Today we uh, have a very special guest with us. We have one of my good friends, Karen Cavett, who is among many things, a graphic designer, a YouTuber, a social media maven, and her most recent thing is she has started a puzzle account. That's right, puzzles. You stuck in quarantine, you don't know what to do? Well, how about a puzzle? Karen's got you covered. She has a YouTube channel called Karen Puzzles, which is wonderful, and we're going to talk to her about it. She's having a little bit of internet difficulties right now, so I'm trying to bring her in to the chat, which is why I'm kind of looking off to the side here, but it looks like she might have connected, maybe? Um, the issues that we're having in Los Angeles are pretty substantial as far as internet outages go, so... We're going to try to bring her in, and if we can't, then we can't. Anyway, um, while we're doing that, I do want to remind you that there is a website that I would like you to go to. It is adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday, and on that website, you will be able to get all of the tutorials and manuals for not only this stream, but all of the other streams that I've done. It's um, basically your one-stop shop, your hub for everything that you need um, as far as my tutorials go. So you can go there, follow along with today's tutorial. We have um, some things that you may have seen in previous episodes and some things that are brand new. So let's try to get Karen over here. I Yeah, it keeps not working. She keeps not being able to connect. You know what? That is all right. We're just going to move on and go straight into the tutorial unless she can connect ah this is stressful to do this live um if you're in the chat please let me know where you're watching it from we have kathy from sunny san jose um parker gibbons is here to learn thank you brian from the uk um welcome felix welcome scott welcome marjorie Pete, who is coming every week, and I love that you um, come back and back to learn at the adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday website also, by the way, is where you can enter to win a full year of Creative Cloud, which means you get 12 months of the whole master suite for free just by entering your information here. Uh, you get entered into a contest to win it. And last week's winner is actually a regular attendee who has gone to a lot of these sessions. So congratulations. I hope I don't say your name wrong. Pierre Etoine Cotejois. Etoine Cotejois. Pierre Etoine Cotejois, congratulations. You have won the full year of Creative Cloud. Okay, well, looks like Karen is unable to join us. Um, like I said, the internet issues have been pretty rough here in Los Angeles, especially if you are on Wi-Fi. So we're going to jump into the tutorial. Unle oh, she's here. She's totally here. Oh my God. Everybody, welcome Karen Cavett. We actually made it work. Here we go. Hey, Karen. Um, Let's see. Karen, can you hear me? Oh my gosh, I can hear you now. Hello. <laughs> everything is working hello thank you for putting up with that and for trying really hard we made it work so for those people who don't know um talk to me a little bit about what you do on youtube so i have a youtube channel called karen puzzles uh you can see some of the puzzles behind me i talk about jigsaw puzzles and i do jigsaw puzzles and i try to find the weirdest jigsaw puzzles i can yeah and how when did you start this channel and why did you start this channel so i started this channel about two years ago but i started my first youtube channel in 2008 and i i did a lot of different things but i was doing a lot of diy i got a little burnt out wanted to talk about puzzles and people liked those videos so i decided to re-upload them onto a brand new channel and Karen puzzles was born yeah, I think doing puzzles is such a relaxing activity and a lot of people are really into it. So you not only show puzzles that people can do, but you're also showing ways that they can um, be better at 
doing puzzles. You have all of these like tips and how to videos and little things, you know, more than just your basic uh, start on the edge kind of tips. So what is your primary way of making and shooting that content? Like what is your lighting setup look like? What is your camera setup look like? So that changed recently because my roommate moved out of this apartment. So I turned his room, which is where I am right now, into my studio. Oh, one so. second. They're saying that you are very loud and I am very quiet. So give me just one sec <laughs> and let me adjust. Sorry, everybody. Alrighty. So I turned myself down or no, I should turn myself up. I turned myself up. There we go. So how was that? Let me know, everybody. If this these levels are good, Karen, just give me a one, two, three. Hello, one, two, three. Hello, one, two, three. If those levels are good, just give me a purple heart in the comments, and that way I'll know that the levels are good. Um, it is... We, we couldn't have a proper, uh, our proper tech rehearsal the same way we usually have because we've been having so many internet issues. So if you, if it's fine, Karen is still louder, somebody says. Okay. So Karen, go ahead and give me a one, two, three again. Uh -huh. Hello, one, two, three. Hello, one, two, three. Hello, one, two, three. How is that? Are we more evened out now? Let me know if those levels are good. Okay, Kathy says they're better. Thank you, Kathy. So Karen was saying, uh, you were saying that you shoot them, you used to shoot them natural light, and now you mm -hmm. have a little bit of a different setup. Yeah, so now that I have a room where I can just leave all of my filming junk in without it like being in the living room, um, I have two cameras and I have two lights that I use. And occasionally so, I'll set up a third camera, but it's not as nice as the two main ones. How do you do, you do a lot of over the top shots. How do you do those? Mm -hmm. So that's like the best, I don't know, like $60 I ever spent. I just bought an arm off of Amazon that attaches to my tripod. And then the camera goes on the end of it. So the camera ends up pointing straight down at the table. And I need a weight on the other end to balance out the camera. And then you get that beautiful top down shot. You also have this very flat, beautiful, soft lighting. How do you achieve that? Um, I'm really bad at lighting, but I bought two lights and I have them set up so that they're sort of pointing like 45 degrees up at the ceiling. So it's not directly on what I'm filming because then you get really harsh shadows. But that just creates a lot of um, bounced light onto me or onto the table. And then I also always brighten things up in Premiere afterwards. Um, speaking of Premiere, what is your like go-to workflow? Um, because you record with two different cameras. Mm -hmm. There's a top-down camera. There's a side camera. There's also some talking to camera shots. Mm -hmm. Do you record those mid-edit, after shooting, before shooting, the audio? Like, what is your whole situation there? So... I'll usually import everything all at once once I'm done. Well, sometimes I'll do the intro. I'll import that, make sure the audio is good before I like open everything up. But then once I get going, I'll just get going. And then I sync everything up so that I have it all nice in a row. And then I can see exactly like what footage I'm working with. Um, the vlog parts, since I'm the one that's in the video, I know at what point in the footage they'll need to go. So I'll just import those and insert them where they need to go. Yeah. And as far as your graphics treatment, you do use some graphics. What do you use mm -hmm. there? Uh, I use just very simple, like text tools in Premiere, just with shadows, nothing fancy. I have used essential graphics at times, uh, but for what I'm personally doing, I find that it's not totally necessary and it can be a little much. So I prefer to just write out the graphic with the text tool, have it fly in, have it fly out, and we're good. You do do one graphic, though, where it's like a overlay of a recording, like as if mm -hmm. it's uh, through the camera monitor. What What <laughs> is that for? So that's for the vlog footage that I shoot on my phone, mostly just to tell the audience to give them a visual cue, but it's a different type of footage. 
And also, since it's handheld and it's just a phone, to maybe have a little more forgiveness for if the footage isn't perfect, if the colors and the lighting aren't great, because it, it sort of signals to them like, oh, this is, you know, vlog footage and not full on professional footage. Yeah, so you're using the graphics to differentiate between mm. your vlog footage and your professional footage, even though honestly, like phones these days have gotten so advanced that if it wasn't handheld, if it was like on a tripod, I don't think people could be able <laughs> to tell. Um, so what is your philosophy towards doing be to, towards doing how-to videos? There's different mm. ways to do how-to videos. There's not like one main way mm -hmm. you've kind of adjusted your philosophy over the years because you don't just do puzzle videos you also make tons of how-to videos for hdtv so what are what is your like thought process behind creating them so i find that there are two ways to go about it number one is where it's all about the project and that's what i've done for a lot of my career is film doing the project after that write a voiceover and then match the two up. And at that point, there's not a lot of room for your personality to come through. I mean, it's, it is me doing a voiceover, but I'm not like making jokes and talking to camera and all of that. So it's very much about here is the project, here are the steps. The other way to go about it is where it's all about the personality. So that's where you have the camera set up and you're like, hello, today I am making this, come along with me on this journey and then you see yourself doing it in real time. I mean, it can be sped up, but it's much more about what's happening in the moment. And at that point, it's kind of less about the process and the project, and it's more about the personality of the presenter. Yeah, um, Kathy in the chat room says, I love puzzles, but cats make it impossible. Now I happily watch Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that that brings the topic of Sometimes things aren't necessarily how-to videos for the purpose of being a how-to video. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's just for entertainment. I know in the makeup world, um, every Halloween, there's like hundreds of Halloween tutorials that come out. And I'm only going to do the one tutorial that's going to be my Halloween costume. Everything else I'm just watching just to have fun with it. Mm. And that really, really shows. So for you, I think you found this like really good mix between educational content and entertainment, edutainment, if you want to call it that. The other day you made a video about like how to puzzle while exercising, which is not a how-to video. It's actually like pretty, it was just an entertaining, like silly video. Um, but I think it just helps because people can see your personality shine through and you can insert those types of videos in between like mm -hmm. the actual tutorials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of a shift that I've made fairly recently is I like to think of it as focusing more on the Karen and less on the puzzles, even though the puzzles still kind of create the, the focus and the framework for what I'm doing is kind of letting people in and showcasing your own personality gives them a reason to want to continue to come back. Yeah, I also kind of want to talk about um, when you are doing how to's with inanimate objects, with objects like puzzles, um, or anything that doesn't move, what are some tips that you can give for shooting them in interesting ways? I'm showing right mm -hmm. now on the screen, your tour of your new puzzle room. And there's things like you're moving the camera, you have your hands in there. Um, how do you go about filming something like that? So for that, I mean, yeah, obviously, since I'm not doing a puzzle, I'm just showing a static thing on shelves. I really tried to use my hands to point to what I was talking about, give people, you know, to kind of um, focus where they're looking, and then also come in with close-ups and do pans across what I'm talking about so that people can really see what it is that I'm referring to. But any kind of static shot, people are going to get bored. You have to find some kind of movement, whether that's what's happening in frame or moving the camera. Yeah, absolutely. Think of a video as it needs to be a video. This is something that I teach when I'm talking about product videos. Um, everything needs to have movement that could be mm -hmm. 
camera movement, that could be movement in the frame, or that could be lighting. You could do a lighting change and that could still be really interesting. You see those ads for like iPhones or whatever where it's static, but it's just like the slightest sheen of, of light just coming across it and giving it that movement. Um, it just really makes your content more dynamic. And to add to that, everything else that you do, like you're putting the, the interstitial graphics on it, even if it is just words, you're putting that little overlay, you're giving it these little touches of production value that really make you stand out, make you unique. In fact, um, you're getting recognized by so many puzzle companies now, which is amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, that's one of the benefits to having a very small, specific niche is that everybody within that niche will find out who you are. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is also a good thing. So if you can if you can narrow your scope a little bit, you mm -hmm. might be more successful um, than in like the general scale and scheme of things. Well, Karen, I'm actually super glad that we <laughs> eventually got this to work midstream. How about that? Claps for us and adjusted audio on the fly. Thank you for having uh, the t for taking the time to be here with me. If people want to check out your work, check out your stuff, where should they head? Uh, they can go to my Instagram, which is at Karen Puzzles, and my YouTube is Karen Puzzles. Or if you just search Jigsaw Puzzles, you'll find me. Well, there you heard it, folks. Uh, thank you, Karen, very much. And a lot of the things that you just talked about, I'm going to cover in my upcoming tutorial. So have a great rest of your day. Bye. Yeah, you too. Bye. All right. So that was our chat with Karen Cavett of Karen Puzzles. Um, I hope you learned something new. She, her, her puzzle channel just kind of blew up over quarantine. And it's so nice to hear. So nice to see because we've been good friends for many years. Um, let me just switch on over to editing mode and we will cover a few things. Again, if you're new to the stream, if you're new to the chat, if you go over here to adobe.ly slash tips Tuesday, you'll be able to get all of the manuals, which means everything that I'm showing, I made notes for, and you can just download the notes and figure it out. Like as I'm going, you can look at the notes and you do not have to take any yourself. Also here, you can enter to win for 12 months of free Creative Cloud, which is really, really awesome and a great deal. So you should definitely take advantage of the, that opportunity. And um, another thing that I just want to plug right quick is Adobe Video World is coming up, which is a conference that I'm teaching at, but also a lot of other amazing Adobe trainers and actually at Adobe Video World, Adobe are rolling out their Adobe Certified Professional certification. So if you want to be certified as an Adobe Certified Professional in order to teach Adobe or to impress people on your resume, then go ahead and check out Adobe Video World and um, read about that on their website and maybe attend my classes. I'm gonna be doing a lot of really interesting classes where I open up some of my most beefy projects and I show you inside. All right, so let us head to Premiere and check some stuff out. We are going to create a custom text template just like Karen does for her interstitials. So, mm -mm -mm. here we go. Okay, let's pop over. All right, so here we are in my project. And this is just a demo project. So I have a couple clips here, nothing too crazy. But one thing that I wanna show you, one thing that Karen does with her interstitials is she will do a Gaussian blur effect and then put text on it. So she'll do something like this in her, um, I'm doing a 2000 piece gradient puzzle in one day video. She will take like sections of the video and she'll do this little, this little interstitial graphic that's coming up right right here, right there. So by having that Gaussian blur on the, 
behind uh, the text. It just makes the text a lot more legible and easy to read. So it's really easy. You just grab your clip here. You go over to your effects panel, which is right here, and you look for Gaussian Blur. You can even type it in, Gaussian Blur, and then drop it in. And now over here, oh, one sec. Now over here in the menu, you can now change the blurriness and the blur dimensions. So let's see what that does. If I increase the blurriness, it will blur my entire image. The more I increase it, the more it will blur. But you see what happens is around the edges, there's this dark black vignette that happens because it's actually blurring it um, around the edges on the inside. So if you don't want that dark vignette, all you have to do is select repeat edge pixels and that is going to fill in that vignette, repeat the edge pixels and kind of flatten out that image. If you choose to do different blur dimensions, you don't have to go horizontal and vertical. You can go just horizontal or just vertical. So going just horizontal will look something like this. Let me increase the blurriness so you can see. And if I, yeah, and then going just vertical is something like this. But horizontal and vertical will create this nice kind of shallow blur. And then another thing you can do, something that I really like doing when I use this trick, is I'll take the opacity and I'll move it down to something like 50%. So that it's just a kind of a darker background that I can then place my text on. So what Karen does is she will just take the type tool, regular type tool, and she'll place the text. So whatever that interstitial reads. In this case, she wrote the middle. So I will also write the middle. The middle. There we go. Now it's the wrong font. It's the wrong color. It's the wrong everything, but we can now change it. So by going to Essential Graphics, the Essential Graphics panel here under the Edit tab, we can select that layer that I just made, the middle, and then we can go down into the text controls. And now I can choose what I want. So let's make it Gil Sands. I love Gil Sands. So Gil Sands Bold. Select all that. Gil Sands Bold. And we will make it white. And we'll center it. We will center align it as well, which means that it'll choose the exact center of the frame, both vertically and horizontally. So see what this does? If the text was off to the side, let's say the text was like here or something, and then I clicked the vertical center and the horizontal center buttons, now it's in the center. And whenever we type new things, it grows out of the center. And then let's add a little bit of a shadow to this, just to help us pop it out from the background a little bit more. Let's give it a black color, a little bit more distance. There we go, so the middle. And actually, let's make the whole text bigger. So every time we have an interstitial, this is what it's gonna look like. You don't need to add anything crazy to it. You don't need to add animation. You don't need to add anything else. Say if this is the thing that you are always using, this is the title that you will be using no matter what video you have. This is like your standard font, your standard settings. All you have to do is right click on the actual clip in the timeline. So you right click on it. And then right here, there's a button that says export as motion graphics template. So you can make your own template to use in Premiere Pro. Export as motion graphics template. Then you give yourself, give it a name. So I will name it um, standard Gil Sans interstitial. You can save it to your local drive, that's fine. And you can select things like warn me if this template uses fonts that are not available on Adobe fonts. This isn't 
uh, available on Adobe Fonts. Um, warn me if this motion graphics template uses any effects not included in Premiere Pro. But if you're just making this for your own purposes and for your own computer and not trying to like export this or send it to somebody else, then you don't have to worry about these. You don't even have to put keywords in if you don't want. I mean, you can. So I'm going to put in text, two lines, title, um, overlay. So that, that that's some, some keywords that can help me find it later. And then maybe interstitial. And then I'm going to press OK. And now you can see instead of the edit tab, we can go to the browse tab instead, click on the browse tab, and it should appear in your templates folder, in your local templates folder. Should be here. Let's try that again. Maybe I didn't click export. Oh, I'm just going to save it to my local templates folder. That's right. I sa saved it to my drive, not my local templates folder. That was the issue. So <clears throat> this, this way it goes straight into Premiere Pro and I can use it right away. Let me know if you have any questions in the chat. I'm also monitoring the chat as well. So here it is, the, mid the middle interstitial. So if I'm trying to, you know, put it somewhere else, like on a completely different project, like maybe I'll go over to um, this one, this project. Actually something that, let's see, a different, something like, this timeline instead, I can go ahead and just drag it on. And now I have the same text and everything and I can write new stuff, new stuff here or whatever. And I can always adjust it as well. So if I need to like change the size or whatever, but at least the the basic, you know, information about this template is stored on my machine. So no matter what I open or where I open it, it'll always be there for me. So some other cool effects that I like to use um, are, so this is, you know, the Gaussian blur effect. Very effective for doing stuff like this. Sometimes say you have a, let's, let's hide this for a second. Let's get rid of the Gaussian blur effect and take the opacity up to the top. Let's say that you are remaking this video for instead of a horizontal for a vertical video, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on the actual name of the sequence. And then I'm going to reveal the sequence in the project. So it finds it in the project. So now that it's found it, I can right click and I can duplicate it. And let me just call this vertical and open that up. And now that I've opened it up, let me go to sequence, sequence settings. I can change this to 1080 by 1920. So this is something that I love doing with the Gaussian blur effect. Say that, for example, I don't want to fill this on the whole screen. I want it to be, maybe it's, maybe it's like a movie and I want the whole thing to be like this, right? But watching this on your phone with these black bars at the top and bottom, it just, it's not, you know, it doesn't look cute. So instead, what we're going to do is we are going to duplicate the clip on top of itself. So we're going to leave this, you know, be, but underneath, we're going to put a copy of it and we're going to Gaussian blur and uh, lower the opacity of that copy. So we're going to duplicate this clip on top of itself by holding down alt and dragging up. And that way the clip is, clip is duplicated on top of itself. We're going to select the bottom clip. Oh, you don't see me, huh? Hold on. Something happened. One sec. I'm not sure what happened, but um, we're going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. 
having a load of technical difficulties today for no good reason, but I am back now. Yay! Hi, I'm back. All right, let's get back into this tutorial. All right, so you can see um, I have my, I just duplicated the clip. Again, I uh, pressed Alt and dragged it up. And now this bottom clip, let me actually label it with um, mango so you can see it a little bit better. So this mango clip, I am going to, first of all, I'm going to increase the scale of it. So right now this is at 30%. So I'm going to increase the scale of it, fill the screen. I can even adjust it a little bit. There we go. And then I'll go back to my effects here. I'll go to Gaussian blur, drop the, it on, increase the blurriness, make sure that repeat edges is selected, and then take down the opacity. And see, that just kind of gives it a more professional look if you're trying to post this to vertical. Um, of course, this clip, the way that I shot all of these clips, you can crop it tighter, right? I made sure to shoot them wide enough so that if I wanted to do them vertical later, I could, I could do something like that, but on the off chance that maybe you didn't shoot wide enough or you need the entire width of the screen, this is a fun tip that you could do. So that is um, Gaussian Blur. That is something that you can do. Another thing that I love doing, this is my one of my top, top, top effects that I use is of course warp stabilizer. So let's check out this clip. This was shot in 60 frames per second slow motion but even with the slow motion there's still a little bit of jitteriness here so let's just play this clip let's do um let's render it out so you can see it a little bit better so let's make it full screen by you can make anything full screen by pressing the tilde key, by the way, which is the little squiggly line at the top left of your keyboard. And you can keep replaying the same section of your timeline by selecting the, um, the re, what's it called? Loop, loop playback, that's what it's called, by the loop playback tool. So you can select the loop playback tool, which is right here. If it doesn't show up on your timeline, you can just go to the button editor over here, click that plus, find the loop playback tool and drag it into your buttons here. So if you select loop playback, now you can actually just keep looping that same clip over and over again. And you see what happens kind of like as she's right here, as she's about to bend over, the camera is a little shaky. You know, it's really hard to find a shaky camera clip because I am not a shaky camera person. So, um, but yeah, there's a little bit of shake there. So instead of just scrapping this shot, all I have to do is go to warp stabilizer, which is again in our effects here, warp stabilizer right there and put it on the clip. Now it takes a few seconds for it to work. It analyzes the clip. What's cool is that it analyzes it in the background. So it's in the background. You can keep working on your project. You can keep working on other parts of your sequence while you wait for this clip to analyze. So let's just wait for a second. I used to have a version of it stabilized, but I think I deleted the stabilization. Let's look at these options real quick. So first of all, it's gonna ask you, what is the result you want from the stabilization? Do you want smooth motion or no motion? No motion is gonna be kind of like a tripod. It's gonna to try to make there no motion in the clip at all. Smooth motion is going to just smooth out the motion that you currently have, so to make it kind of look like a steady cam shot. You can make it smoother, so change the smoothness method uh, level. The method here is very important because this is going to determine how it does the stabilization. So a lot of people like to use subspace warp, which warps the image and kind of gives it like um, in, in certain situations, it's fine, like using it for architectural stuff or for nature stuff. But when I'm shooting people, I prefer to use position scale rotation or position. So all of all that is going to do 
is it's going to take your clip and imagine just like the whole clip, it's going to reposition it, kind of shake it about to make sure that it's in the same spot. So here I'll show you what it's done to this clip over here. So I've added the warp stabilizer. Yeah, it needs to be rendered first, but I've added the warp stabilizer. Um, I've used the method, let's just do position scale rotation, which is my favorite one, but I like to do something, I like to preserve scale because in this case, um, I know for sure that I wasn't moving forward and back and I just, I just don't want it to mess with the scale. And then for framing, I don't want it to um, synthesize my edges. I don't want it to auto scale to change the scaling. I just want it to stabilize. Just stabilize, please. Position and rotation, please. And preserve the scale. So I just want it to kind of arrange around that clip. I'm just going to go to the end of the clip by going to the up and down arrows. I'm going to press O to um, isolate this, just this section of the timeline. I'm going to go to sequence, render into out so I can render it and show you all what that looks like. So here's what that looks like. And pay very close attention to what's happening here at the edges specifically this black edge right here. Because I didn't choose to auto, auto crop and synthesize those edges, you will be able to see this black edge kind of wiggle. All right, so let's play that. See that black edge wiggling? Let's adjust this a little bit. But if you ignore the black edge for a second and just look at the subject in the frame, you'll be able to see that that, that motion, that jitteriness is smoothed out. But then you have this black edge. So what do you do? Well, you can do a couple things, right? You can let Premiere do this for you. So if you go into, again, your warp stabilizer settings, oh, I have it on here twice. That's what's happening. If you go into your warp stabilizer settings here under framing, um, you can say, uh, well, stabilize crop auto scale, and that will do it for you. So with stabilize crop auto scale, I didn't have it on before because I had two warp stabilizers on. Whoopsie. With stabilizer crop auto scale, what happens is, you see there's no more edge here, but what it's done is it's cropped into our frame here and we've lost some pixels, but it does a pretty good job of trying to not let you lose as many pixels as like not let you let you lose the least amount of pixels. Let's say that it does a good job of um, of making it as usable as possible. So you can do that. Um, one cool thing in this new kind of warp stabilizer that update for Premiere is that no longer does your footage have to be the same size as your sequence for warp stabilizer to work. So if we wanted to do something like stabilize only and then go to the scale and change the scale and make it smaller, for example, we can and warp stabilizer is still going to work and you'll see it kind of bouncing around so you'll see what it does. If I render it and show you, you'll see it bouncing around in the in there. See how the, the whole frame is bouncing around and reframing? It's just a good way to tell that that is now what's happening. And if you wanted to, for example, put this now in its own little in its own little cropped square, you can make a subsequence of it. You can right click, nest it. A nested sequence, I mean. And you can call it, you know, nested Dana um stabilized and now this is a nested sequence and now you can drop something like a crop effect on it drop that crop effect and then crop in from the left the right the top and whatever you want to do place it wherever you want in the frame maybe you want it on the bottom right corner maybe you want to put that nested sequence on top of the other sequence like that. I'll take the Gaussian blur off 
I don't know. There's there's a million things that you could do. And now that little that little square is not only is it stabilized, but it's not going to be moving around and wiggling. So if we do if we render that out, go to sequence render into out, you'll be able to see that effect. And that's kind of cool too what I just did right there. Honestly with beauty and fashion footage, it's it's pretty uh it's pretty foolproof. If you have a beautiful woman in front of the camera, see that? Anyway, so another thing that I want to show you is what's going on here. So this just a very simple effect. If you want to flip your footage, you can use vertical flip or horizontal flip. So you can just uh, search for the word flip and you can drag those straight up in here. So if we drag horizontal flip, which is one of my, one of my favorite effects, it'll just flip it. And what is this good for? Well, it's good for stuff like when you're putting together motion clips that are going left to right or right to left. So for example, here, let's say that um, initially, well, she's going, She her motion of her body is going from right to left and her motion of her body is going from right to left, right? But if this wasn't the clip, so if the clip originally looked like this and the motion of her body was going from left to right and then she was going from right to left, it would just look off, you know? So then you would place a horizontal flip effect and you would fix that. So that's what I like using horizontal flip for. I like using it for things where, you know, or like here, she's looking to the, she's looking to the, right here but then in the next clip she's looking to the left and I want it to stay consistent so I can either flip this clip and make her look that way so now she from one frame to the other she looked that way and now she's looking that way or I could flip the second clip instead so now I have options I can flip the second clip instead and now on the second clip she's looking to the right I just like using flips for consistency's sake. Um, Marjorie says, the warp stabilizer effect is my favorite effect in Premiere Pro. It's literally magic. It takes a shot from unusable to usable in seconds, and it has saved me many times in the cutting room. Yeah, me too. I love the warp stabilizer effect. And then the last fun effect that I want to show you is this effect called corner pin, which... Um, is really, really great if you are trying to demonstrate something on like a phone screen or on some sort of 2D surface. So in this case, we have this clip and then underneath it, we have this photo of a phone. Or you could have a clip of a phone, but in this case, it's a photo of a phone. And we wanna replace what's in this phone with uh, this top layer clip instead. So one thing we could do is we can scale it down using the effect controls over here. We can scale it down, we can rotate it, and we can even change the opacity a little bit just to make it easier for us. We can adjust it and just kind of try to get it perfect. You know, try, try our best to bring it to where we need it to be, but check that out. Look at that, what that looks like. It is not exactly perfect and it can't get there the way that it is right now because this is like a trapezoidal is that a trapezoid it's tell you what this shape is what is this shape is this a trapezoid or am i just like forgetting all of my basic trigonometry it basically isn't skewed the right way right in Photoshop, you would call this a skew effect. So instead, I'm going to go look for the corner pin effect and drop that corner pin effect into onto that clip. And now take a look. This corner pin effect has these X and Y values for the four pins or the four corners of the clip for the upper left, upper right, lower left, and lower right. So I can go ahead and adjust them now. And as I adjust them, take a look at what's happening over here on the screen. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can, you can tell a little bit better. 
right? So as I adjust the corner pin, I can literally manipulate these corners and get them exactly to where um, I need them to be. So I, I mean, I got pretty close with my estimation earlier, but this is just giving me that extra je ne sais quoi, the extra accuracy. And of course you can do this in After Effects for sure, but wouldn't you love to do this in Premiere and not have to go into another program if you don't have to, right? So now it's perfectly aligned and now I can bring the opacity back up and there we go, perfect perfectly aligned, looks like it's on the screen, and it's a video, right? So now it looks like it's playing on that phone screen. Fernando Del Rio Garcia asked, the pink bar where it says beep drop, how did you put that there? I think you were talking about this right here. So you can put markers on your timeline and they can be durational markers or they can be point markers like this. And you can write whatever you want in them. And that way, when you're editing, you can refer to that later and um, you know, arrange your timeline the way that you want it to. It's really easy to do. All you do is you press M on your keyboard, the M button for marker. So you press M <clears throat> and when you press it, the marker appears both in your program monitor and on your timeline. Then all you have to do is double click the marker, give it a name, so something like intro, give it a duration. Sorry, one sec. Make it a segmentation marker, give it a color. Okay, and now you can arrange that, move it around, whatever. And you can, uh, you know, you can adjust however you see fit. Like here, for example, in my demo, I decided to split up each clip into, and, and give myself a little guide for which clip I was gonna use for which demo. Ah, okay, so um, Scott Harvey said parallelogram. Thank you, Scott Harvey, for answering my earlier question. I really appreciate it. Um, Scott Harvey says she pressed O to isolate. What turns that off? I'm not sure what your question is, but I think you meant the in and out points. So you can select a section of your timeline to either loop or to export or to, um, to render by pressing I and O on your keyboard. For example, in this example here, um, I have my corner pin section of the timeline. And as you can see, it is not rendered. It is red. The indicator is red. So that means that it won't play through smoothly. It needs to be rendered. This warp stabilizer section is all green. That's fine. The Gaussian blur section is yellow. That's fine. But the corner pin section is red. So I want to place in and out points so that I can isolate that and ex uh, and render just that. So I'm going to press up and down on my keyboard. Up and down on your keyboard will go to the next cut point. So I'll go to that cut point. I'll press I. I'll go to the next cut point. I'll press O. So now it has selected the in and out points right here and I can go into sequence, render into out, render that little section, and after I render it, it's gonna turn green. And then to clear the in and out points, I right click and I go to clear in and out. I don't, I don't know if I can zoom in on that, but yeah, you go to clear in and out, and now the in and out points aren't there anymore. I hope that answers your question, Scott Harvey. Um, Sophie Marie, Gielen says, this looks so much easier. I learned so much during these live streams. So thank you, Valentina. Thank you, Sophie. I'm glad that you are learning. So we talked about how to create a custom text template. We talked about some of my favorite footage effects like Gaussian blur, horizontal and vertical flip, work stabilizer. Let's talk about how to faux track something. In our After Effects tutorial, we did literal tracking, like pinning and tracking, but you can also faux track things in Premiere. And it, 
you know, it's good enough. So here I have my, a TikTok that I made recently. And what I want to do is I want to put a piece of text, a little text graphic right between my fingers over here. And I also, I want to track it. So as my fingers move around the frame, you see how like, I'm not the most stable handed person. So my fingers are moving about. So I just want to faux track it. I don't want to actually track it. So let's first grab some sort of graphic. So let's go to browse and let's use this bold pop title. Let's bring that in. Bold pop. All right, so we can change a few things. We can double click on it. Let's just write text for now. Let's go to select the box and go to fill. Let's make it a bright green. There it is. And now we can move it. Here's the thing about moving graphics though. There are two ways to move graphics. They're in your effect controls um, panel. There is the way to move them called vector motion over here. And there's the normal video controls for it. So effect controls, this is the vector motion, and this is the video controls. If you don't want anything in your graphic to accidentally slip or, you know, you, you never know who built the graphic and how they built it. Um, and you want to instead move this whole thing as a layer instead of as a graphic, like as a whole layer. So instead of moving it around with the position controls over here, we're gonna move her around with the position controls here under video. So I'm gonna use those position controls and move that text graphic over in between my fingers. I can still use the vector controls to make it bigger though. Scale, not a problem. And these, by the way, these controls right here in the essential graphics panel, these are the same as these. You can see I just increased the scale to 105 and it actually updated here as well to 105. So I can be, let's see if I can get it all on the same screen. I can be changing the scale here and the scale changes over there as well. So now that I have my text there, actually maybe I want the text to be black now that I think about it, just to give it a little bit more pop. There we go. <clears throat> so here in the motion position controls, I am going to keyframe the position by pressing the toggling the animation stopwatch and it's going to turn blue. And when I do that, a keyframe actually appears in this timeline over here, which means at this point in time, please keep the graphic here. And then I can just move forward in time. So my playhead, which is here, I can move forward in time a little bit and then adjust my movement again. You can see every time I adjust my movement, it adjusts that it adjusts that keyframe and I can move it again and adjust the keyframe. You can move it forward to where my hands appear and adjust the keyframe, etc., etc. I can also adjust the scale if I want. So, you know, my fingers are a little closer together there, so I'll adjust the scale there. I'll go down here, I'll move it. So you can see I'm kind of, when, when the movement is so fast, like what I'm doing here, no one's gonna notice that you faux tracked this thing. No, one, no one's gonna care. So let's go to the finished demo of this tracking and see what it looks like finished. So let's fit that in. And let's watch. Uh, let me do in and out points and turn on the loop playback option. Awesome. So there's that text. That There's that graphic. So the second time I do it is actually f like, I, I do it twice in the actual clip. That's why you're seeing me do it a second time. But yeah, basically, you can see how I faux tracked it and it works and it doesn't have to be anything too fancy, too fancy schmancy. All right, since um, we got here late with Karen because we had technical difficulties, I still wanna finish um, the last thing that I wanted to show you today, which is a little bit about audio. So let's just jump into it and do it real quick. So, 
let's go to this one. All right. So here I have a, let's just call it a vlog. <laughs> and on track A2, I have my music. On track A1, I have a few clips here. These are these red these red clips right here that are basically um, me talking straight to camera. And then everything else is voiceover. So basically what I want to do is I want to put more voiceover right here on the A1 track. And then also here underneath, these are my, um, my effects tracks, my audio effects uh, clips on track A3. So what I'll do first is I will mute the um, music track and the effects track by pressing the M buttons. So I will mute them because when I'm recording my voiceover, I don't want to hear my voiceover. But I'm also going to take off my headphones. So I guess you don't have to mute them, but I don't want the audio coming through my headphones either. So I'm just going to mute them. And then I'm going to place my playhead, which is this blue line where I want my voiceover to start. So I'm going to move it to right there. I want my voiceover to start right there. <laughs> Hold on, okay. Um, hmm, weird. Why is it not? Sometimes I swear. Oh, you know what? It's probably because my microphone isn't selected. Aha, because I've been having audio issues. So let's just make sure that Premiere registers and understands that I have a microphone connected to it. So I'm going to go to edit or on a Mac, you would just go to the Premiere menu and here under uh, preferences, I'm going to go to audio hardware. So this is where you make sure that your mic is selected and that everything's working. So I'm going to go to audio hardware and yep, for sure. It says that the microphone that I'm still, I have selected is not working, which is news to me because I'm literally using it to talk to you right now. So there we go. It's not working. Cool. I love that. My favorite thing is when microphones don't work. Okay. How about... Let's just, let's just spoof it. Let's just say NVIDIA RTX voice. Let's open up, let's route the microphone through NVIDIA just because um, for some reason it's not showing up, even though I've done it 6 billion times. So let's put it that through, let's select that, and that should work now. Yes. Uh, that also says not working. Cool. Love it. Love that. Anyway. All right. I'm just going to cancel out of there. But the way that you would do this. Oh, now it does work. Great. I did the right thing. Cool. So I'm putting my playhead here at where I want the voiceover to start. And then I'm going to wait, really? <laughs> oh my gosh. Sometimes, I swear, I think things are going to work and then they don't. But basically, you would press the voiceover record button and then it will give you a countdown and you will be able to record the voiceover for your particular how-to video or for your vlog or whatever straight into Premiere. Um, and yeah, I'm 99% sure it's not working because I had mic issues today because I had internet issues and everything's connected and everything is great. So after you've created your voiceover, so here I have already created my voiceover. There it is. These are all of my voiceover clips. What I'll do is I'll select them and in essential, um, sorry, in essential sound, you can go ahead and you can give them a, <clears throat> You can give them, you can assign them as dialogue. So let me quickly remove attributes. Let's go, let's remove all these. Um, 
Anyway, they are assigned as dialogue right here because I selected them and I clicked dialogue. And then my audio, my music is assigned as music. So what I can do is I can use ducking to duck the music under the dialogue. So if I select the music and then I go to ducking, enable that, I can then set like the sensitivity, the duck amount. This will basically cause the music to get louder in between the gaps in my voiceover so that the audio levels stay consistent throughout. And you can see I've already added some ducking here. So the volume line is a ramp. It is, it goes higher and then it goes down. It's not a very um, rough ramp, but it's still there. You can still see if I expand it, you can definitely see. So if I can just expand the size of this audio track, you can see that that volume is going up and then down. If I want it to be more severe, I can go ahead and adjust that over here in the options for the ducking. So I can do something like, uh, I want the duck amount to be a lot more severe and I can click generate keyframes and then, oh, then it just gets rid of it entirely. Let's try that again. Let's go sensitivity, very sensitive, fades very fast, duck amount very high. Let's try that. There we go. So you can see now the duck amount is a lot higher. If I want it to be even higher, I can increase the duck amount, click generate keyframes again in the essential sound panel and it they will go even higher. I normally don't recommend ducking this much. This much will just be way too intense. I normally recommend ducking around 10 decibels if you would like. Whew. All right. So Pete says, Valentina always stays so cool in the face of tech issues. Let me tell you, I've been teaching for, I think this is my fifth year teaching and it, I don't know what's more stressful having tech issues in a room of a, like a thousand people or having tech issues in your bedroom with 29 people in the chat room, but it's always incredibly stressful no matter how I may make it seem. Um, if you would like a replay of this tutorial or better yet, if you would like the full manual that I created for this tutorial, I'll show you what it looks like right here. So we have, um, you know, how to use graphics templates, how to create a custom template, how to do the flow tracking that I just talked about, all of my favorite effects and how to use them, how to record voiceover to the timeline and how to auto duck music under dialogue. All of that can be ly slash tips Tuesday. That is also where you can uh, put your information in for a chance to win 12 months of Creative Cloud, which is like the master suite, which is everything. And um, yeah, that's where you can rewatch all of these tutorials. Don't forget Adobe Video World is coming up in September. Check it out, Google it. Lots of awesome instructors. You can get, pers like, actually I think you can get a year's worth of film school in just a couple days just by going to Adobe Video World. So definitely check it out. Check out their um, Adobe certification program as well to become certified in Adobe. And see you around the internet. Until next week, um, have a great rest of your day. Have a lovely afternoon, evening, morning, night, wherever you are. I hope that you stay safe, healthy, and happy. Bye, everybody.